I have just five things to say on this topic. But before I get to them, I want to give you a brief example, which illustrates why I selected these five things. As you can see, I'm an upside-down polio. No use of arms, good use of legs. I left my wheelchair behind in my teens. Throughout high school, college, and 20 years of teaching, I walked to and from classes up and down stairs. In the early 1980s, I began to dread going down long st staircases and walking long distances across open spaces or on uneven surfaces. I said nothing about this to anyone, but I went to great lengths to avoid staircases. This got worse until it got to the point that I dreaded going down even the four steps outside my office building on campus. I would sit in my office and worry about going to a meeting or even getting out of the office at the end of the day. I thought it was a phobia, a problem of panic attacks. Finally, I went to see a psychiatrist who specialized in rehabilitation. He is totally blind, the first and perhaps the only person who has ever gone through medical school with that disability. His office was in a handsome old house. It had five uneven stone steps from the parking lot up to four more steps to the front porch. No handrails to lean on. Not good. After we introduced ourselves, I described my symptoms and told him I needed help with my panic attacks. He said, what is bothering you right now? I said with some heat, I am bothered about how I'm going to get out of your building and back to the car. He picked up the phone and called his secretary. Don't we have a ramp that runs around the back of the building and down to the parking lot? The secretary apparently said yes. I relaxed. He said, how do you feel now? I said, I feel fine about that. He said, can you move your office to a different building? No. Can the university build you a ramp? Possibly. He said, all through medical school and my residency, I took subways to and from school. As a blind man, I am terrified of subway platforms. It's a reasonable fear. You'll notice I chose to practice in a city without subways. And I began to feel really foolish. The university built a ramp for me. I got an electric scooter with foot controls. End of that story. But things like that have continued to happen to me throughout my life and continue to happen today. Furthermore, they happen to everyone I know, disabled or not. This fact leads to the five things I want to say on the topic of the day. The first thing is the importance of agency. Being an agent in the world, not a patient. And there are three big tasks of agency. One big task is to become and remain an agent in the first place. Every human being starts out as a patient, mostly. Human infants, entry-level human beings as I call them, can't do much of anything for themselves. We all have to be fed, clothed, bathed, entertained, educated. People make decisions for us. We have to learn to be agents from scratch and eventually to take charge of our lives. We have to learn and claim our agency. We have to earn it. The most devastating forms of disability 
by the ones that leave us without the ability to achieve any significant measure of agency at all, beyond what we might call infant agency. Even if polio paralyzes you completely in infancy, it doesn't destroy your ability to become and remain a full-fledged agent. But if you get polio at 13, as I did, you have to reclaim your agency. So at first it seemed to me that the whole effort of dealing with disability was going to be reclaiming the status of an agent as far as I could. But after you reclaim your status as an agent, you have to do what everyone else has to do, whether they are disabled or not. You have to make good on the claim. You have to learn and earn the status of agent. So that's the second big task of agency, becoming good at it. This is a lifelong effort, and it's a complicated task. It requires lining up six big and complicated things, values, preferences, and goals to begin with, then deliberation, decisions, and actions. If these things don't line up properly, if they're incoherent or incomplete or weak, then you can be paralyzed by ambivalence, like the alcoholic who really wants to stop drinking and also really wants to drink and buys a bottle of vodka on the way to the treatment facility. Or you can be paralyzed by indecision, caught between two choices on the menu, or two new cars in the showroom. Or you can get all that right and still be unable to put your decisions into practice. You can be too depressed to get to the dentist. And if all of that is not enough, there is the changing world around us. Things that used to work well in the old days don't always work well now. So, the third big task of agency is figuring out how to retain the status of agent under changing circumstances. Our physical and social worlds keep changing and keep throwing up unexpected challenges. So like airline pilots, we have to keep learning new skills. But unlike airline pilots, we don't have sophisticated simulators for learning those new skills in safe environments. We have to learn in the air with passengers on board. All of those things had gone awry in the example I gave at the beginning. My agency was compromised and I knew it, but I couldn't figure out why. The second thing in my list of five is the importance of focusing on abilities and ignoring, mostly ignoring, disabilities, at least regarding them as relatively unimportant. And here there are four more tasks that make up this thing. The first one is keeping the focus incessantly on abilities on what it might be possible for you to do. Don't give your disabilities any more thought than other features of the context in which you have to operate. The best rehab specialists do this for you relentlessly. You say, I can't do that. They say, you can do it this way. So keep learning that lesson. The second task is the Socratic one. Know thyself. Know your physical and psychological abilities. That will involve knowing their limits, of course. If you're ignorant about yourself, or worse, if you're self-deceived, 
you're likely to make some pretty dangerous mistakes. Or at the very least, you are likely to make a fool of yourself, as I did. The third task here is keeping an up-to-date, accurate account of what is possible for you, given your abilities, in various physical and social environments. We all achieve stability at some level. We get busy with work and our lives. We lose track of the fit between our abilities and our activities, and that's not good. So then the fourth task is recognizing when we have lost a good fit between our abilities and our activities. We need to develop an internal alarm system, one that tells us to stop suffering and take charge. Get a ramp built. Call Joan at PHI. All of this is a tall order. It takes practice, and it requires some perspective. Which brings us to the next thing in my list of five, the importance of taking a whole life perspective on things. This amounts to regularly constructing and revising a plan for your whole life, one that involves full use of your abilities, and then developing some of them to the point of excellence. We all just muddle through most of the time, and that's all right. The point here is just that sometimes, regularly, we ought to make and revise a life plan as well. It should be coherent, ambitious, possible to achieve, revisable, and ideally compatible with generally rising levels of life satisfaction, as opposed to regret. If I had been keeping things in perspective in the 1980s, I wouldn't have been denying the onset of the late effects of polio. I would have been thinking, it's about 30 years now since I had polio. Maybe this fear of long staircases is not so unreasonable. And that brings me to the fourth thing in my list of five, internal harmony. It's important to make the constant effort to harmonize the components of your life as you work your way through your life plan. To harmonize your spiritual and rational experience, to harmonize your desires with your needs, to harmonize your reason with your action. Disharmonies make lives interesting, mostly for people who like to tell or listen to stories about them. But they also make lives less than satisfying been sometimes fully dysfunctional. Personally, I think having a harmonious, satisfying life is preferable to being an interesting subject for a biographer, or a journalist, or a gossip. So I'm in favor of harmony. But it is hard to harmonize with a brick wall. So the final point in this list of five is about brick walls. You need to learn to recognize the one after you hit it, of course. But you also need to recognize one before you actually hit it hard. This amounts to knowing when to quit, not a minute too soon or a minute too late. That's a lesson about the limits of your abilities throughout life. You want to make sure that what looks like a brick wall actually is one. And then you act accordingly. If it's an illusion, then you can go through it. If it's not, you have to work around it or go in another direction entirely. We all learn this, more or less, if we can get beyond merely infant agency. What we seem to have trouble with is figuring out which brick walls are worth worrying about and regretting 
been trying to tear down. My default position on this has to do with first identifying my most basic life goals and commitments. Commitments to my wife of 46 years and the goals of our life together. Commitments to my professional goals. Commitments to helping to create a truly hospitable physical and social environment for everyone. Now when it comes to things like that, I'm reluctant to call it a brick wall until I actually hit it pretty hard. And even then I'm reluctant to call it quits. Not so much though in the case of ramps. Doing without a wheelchair is not a basic life goal. It's possible to extract all of this from my opening illustration, but I will leave that for you to do. Knowing when to quit is also about knowing when to end a talk like this. And this talk ends now.